introduce myself and Ed, but uh, he stole that, which messes up my whole rhythm. So where was I going to start? <laughs> um, so we want to talk a little bit about how we're using uh, some open source tools to uh, solve a few big content problems that our company's facing using uh, structured, structured authoring. Skip ahead. So content wants to be free. I think this is probably a, an accurate uh, representation of what our content used to be like, you know, total free for all, chaos, unstructured, you never know where things are going to land. So when we talk about what content wants to be fr free, there, uh, we have a certain, uh, a, a different way of thinking about that. So what we realized before is that, you know, our content might have been free flowing, but it wasn't free. We weren't able to use it the way we want, and uh, you know, freedom for us took on a different meaning. If we wanted our content to be free, we really needed to impose structure on it so that our content could be used, so that it could be uh, you know, not just limited to consumption, but that it, it could be uh, brought in by different groups of people, used in different ways. Uh, we have a wide variety of, of kind of user groups that it needs to, to be applicable for. So uh, for us, <coughs> you know, our, our idea of freedom now is to impose some structure that's going to allow this, this different approach to content use. And uh, I'm just going to make a note that we'll be sending the slides out later. Some of them are a little text heavy, I know that, and hopefully that people, if you look at them later, you'll be able to go through and reference and tie back to some of the things we're talking about. So um, to, to kind of accomplish this, you know, we all love to talk about tools. Well, not everyone does, but I'm a tool guy and I love to talk about tools. So you guys are going to have to listen to me for just a minute or two. So, what we're working with for our set of tools is, is Enterprise Media Wiki. Um, some of you probably know what Media Wiki is, some probably don't. It's an open source tool. Uh, it allows you to, uh, you know, create a really nice uh, editing interface. Oh, we're already moving ahead. Um, it allows you to create an inter interesting interface where you can edit content or you can display it for your users. So it serves two purposes. It stores all of your content in a database. Um, that's what MediaWiki is. It's popularly known because of uh, Wikipedia, which everyone's heard of. Huge, you know, this is the, the background platform running it. When you change to Enterprise MediaWiki, what that really means is you're adding in a couple of different extensions that add some functionality to MediaWiki and are going to allow you to do different things. And these are the extensions that we are using that we consider key for our data. We have Cargo. Cargo is an extension that allows us to be really specific. It, let, it lets us slice up our content and store it in the database in ways that we can query later and reuse in different ways. We have page forms. Uh, you know, page forms is a way for us to hammer into our writers that when you're creating content, there's a certain type of structure we want to impose. And we want you to uh, really follow some guidelines that we're presenting for, for our writers. Um, <coughs> I talked before that we have a lot of different content creators. Not everyone who creates content for us is a technical writer. We have a lot of uh, marketing people. We have a lot of people who are maybe managers or other content experts that we want to contribute. And so visual editor is something that's going to kind of cut through uh, the, the difficulty in creating content. It provides a way for them to have a really nice visual interface when they're creating content. Uh, Minty Docs is key for us. Like a lot of other writers, uh, I assume, we have to work on some different factors, uh, so, some different, uh, we have to have access control for some of our content. We have to have uh, the ability to version content, to manage content, to group content in different ways. And Minty Docs is what kind of lets us assemble things, bring them together in different ways. So this is a, a really useful tool for us. And above it all is a nice coat of paint. We have a tweaky skin that changes MediaWiki so that it doesn't look like what you might have seen on other sites, which can be, you know, quite honestly pretty rough. This is a, a nice way to visualize and to make it very dynamic in the display of how we're putting all this content together. So when you take MediaWiki and then you add all of these other tools, that's what really uh, Enterprise MediaWiki is kind of about. And it's about you know, making MediaWiki more useful for technical writers, I think, for, for other enterprises who might want to display content in different ways. Uh, some of these pieces will come back up. Uh, this is our toolkit, but we don't want to think about it just like a toolkit. We also kind of think about it as a, a set of ingredients. Um, and you know, that might seem weird, uh, a set of ingredients, a, a recipe, what are you going to do with it? You know, and that, that leads to the next question. And, and Barry, you know, what, what can you do with it? 
So with the different MediaWiki projects, we've been uh, integrating the content with different groups around the company, um, which is great, right? We're expanding the footprint, we're expand. We're kind of trying to shift our group to become not just a content authoring group, but a service provider for content that other groups author. We don't directly author it, but we just build the pipelines and we understand the content and we understand the top level metadata, we make it all work together. And when you're talking to other people, what does MediaWiki do? It's a little difficult sometimes because it does whatever, kind of whatever you want it to do. It's a set of ingredients you use to then make something. So I've been using the metaphor of a bag of flour and that seems to help people understand. Like you gotta build something to fit the needs of the content, um, not the other way around. You don't fit the content to fit the tool, you just build the tool around your content. Um, so you gotta, def defining your data structure is something that's gonna hit through the whole presentation. It's sort of key, understanding what you want from your content. So the software doesn't really do anything for you out of the box, right? It doesn't solve your content problems. You have to. And I think probably everyone has seen that, not necessarily in tech comm tools, but just in information technology in general, there's a lot of buy a software solution, spend a lot of money, and then hope it just does all the work for you, and you don't have headcount dedicated to uh, managing that content or structuring it or, or whatever. Uh, the software doesn't really do anything if you don't, you need, you need human beings to involved or it doesn't really, in our opinion, it doesn't really work, right? So anyways, um, yeah, the challenge is deciding what you want from your content. And we're going to talk a little bit later about a couple of our major use cases and you'll see the difference between what you, when you know what you want versus when you don't know what you want and how uh, projects can be successful depending on that your answer to that question. So I guess this is a layout of how we're using Enterprise MediaWiki in Genesis right now. So we have uh, a mix of content sites that we directly own. So our public technical documentation sites, as well as uh, the Genesis uh, use cases portal. It's one of our case studies we'll talk about later. So on one side we have content sites that we do own and we sort of manage and author that content directly in MediaWiki. But then there's uh, content sites that we don't own. And this is an aspect of Enterprise and MediaWiki that I think has a lot of potential for, for the future for content management in organizations, right? So there's um, uh, websites owned by other groups that they query Enterprise MediaWiki to pull in content uh, at runtime based on, uh, you know, basically content as a web service or headless CMS is another uh, metaphor people use. But the point is that uh, we can control some content as a, a single source of, of truth repository, but other parts of the organization can own their own websites. They have their own tools that they love, but they can pull in certain values, certain paragraphs, whatever, certain chunks that they need in their content. The rest of it they own, but uh, we don't have to own it. So instead of having a site that uh, we have to own the entire publishing tool chain up to the variety of publishing outputs. We just have a, a hub they can go to, query the content, uh, um, it, it works. Then there's also uh, a lot of our API documentation is docs as code. I think the WTT organization has a lot of experience with that. So we have, you know, a lot of content's already stored in the source code, but we can pull that into Enterprise MediaWiki, so you can add that database layer to the content that with a lot of the docs as code pipelines go up to static sites, there's no database, so there's kind of a limit what you can do with the content. So if you want to take it to the next level and start doing some, some things you can't do with a static site, you can, you can use the same source code in the repository, but you can pull that into Cargo, basically, and then have that available for any of the other websites in, uh, in your company in your system. Uh, so in a nutshell, the content, is, I guess we, we try to think of ways to describe it. Content as a data, content as data or content uh, in a database way. So it's basically all your content is stored as structured fields and database tables. So there, there's, there's key value pairs. I don't know, there's so many metaphors you can use for it, but uh, all stored in a database so that you can then query that database. So every all the content is built via query, not maps, if that makes sense. 
Um, there's two key aspects, I think, of a content as a database approach to content is you have centralized control of the data structure. So there's different user roles in, in this kind of a system, and you can, uh, I think on that later slide, we'll break that down a little bit, but that centralized control of the data structure means you can, uh, uh, you can impose a lot of sanity on your content. Uh, we'll, hopefully, we'll show some examples of that after. And then there's dynamic automated content publishing. Everything is query driven, so you, uh, you make a small change somewhere to your canonical data in the data structure and it propagates automatically through the entire system. Through the authoring portal, through the displays, through any website that pulls the content in via REST API. Uh, you have true uh, control and single source of truth of content uh, where it makes sense to do that. So I guess uh, we're gonna talk quickly about two case studies, uh, you know, because in theory some of this sounds good, in theory some of this probably sounds familiar from other tools and platforms. But uh, I guess for us what really is illustrated is we had two different case studies that were kind of opposites. The first one is our Genesis docs, our, our own technical documentation, where we had been using MediaWiki, but we didn't have a lot of freedom. We didn't have free content. We, it was difficult to really reuse it, to move it around, to share it, uh, because we had a lot of content, we had tools, we even had some of the tools and, and tool chains that we needed, but we hadn't structured our content. And until we were able to impose some structure on our content, that made it really difficult for us to reuse. So you know, we knew our requirements, because this is our own content, we knew it really well, we knew what some of the problems were, we knew what we wanted, but we just, we, we hadn't gotten to the place where we were able to use it. Our other case study that we want to talk about afterwards is the Genesis Use Cases Portal that Barry has mentioned earlier. And uh, a use case for us is essentially a kind of a sellable item. It's something that uh, is put together and, and uh, you know, uh, they had the opposite problem from us where they have really well-defined uh, data structures available to them, but they've been enforcing them through process instead of through the tools that we're using. And so there were a lot of challenges uh, for us to see if, if, you know, there are challenges that, that they were having to work through these processes that weren't really sustainable, that were, were difficult to kind of impose on their writers. Um, we found it was a really a good match for the tool set that we had uh, and really a good way for us to combine you know, our, our knowledge of what they had for understanding data structures, what we had for understanding some of the tools. And I think uh, you know, when we go over them, Barry will show you in more detail how, how that kind of worked out. So um, I guess we'll start on the next slide with uh, the Genesis Docs, this case study. Uh, and I'm going to go over this quickly, and I think I'm going to pass uh, the presentation over to Barry for the, the second uh, case study. So uh, what you see here is, is kind of a screenshot, and this is showing where we need to be. Um, because previously, we had content that, that we would write, and it would look like this, but it wasn't really structured. We, we weren't able to break out and understand what we wanted to do. Um, and so what we, what we decided is that we need to really we want to build uh, EPO-based documentation. Every page is page one. We want to have certain elements that are defined on every article, every single page that we create. And so that's, that was really our starting point, is defining an article, uh, defining the key pieces of content that we need, uh, and trying to understand how those key pieces of content will be reused, not just on the pages here, but in other locations. Uh, so this is one thing that we wanted to, to understand. The second part is, Underneath, you know, once we've established what our page is, we have sections of content, and they, they tend to follow the same types of patterns. There are a couple of different patterns, but they would often follow the same patterns, these structured sections underneath. And so, um, you know, this is an example of what we wanted our content to look like for a, an end user, for someone coming to our portal and being able to read it. Um, I'm just going to mention over here, we also have a note. This is uh, even though the content is structured, this is a part of uh, uh, Minty Docs here where we are, are kind of imposing structure uh, over a set of articles. And so this isn't directly related to uh, the structure we imposed on the specific content, but it's helping us to also uh, create some structure at a larger level. So that's what the table of contents section is here, is a, a series of articles. Uh, if we go to the next slide, so this is actually the same content. Um, but what you can see is earlier on that previous page, you know, the user <coughs> sees that there is a, just a, a nice little EPO heading explaining where they are and what, what content they have. But this is what the writer sees. When the writer comes in and they go to edit the page, 
they would get a nice form. And uh, again, back to the tools, this is you know, using page forms, is creating these forms where we create some very specific uh, fields. We define how content can be entered. Um, and so all of the specific pieces of information were broken out and defined, and there's, there's various in pieces of information. Some of them get translated and they turn into images. Some of them are, are key contextual statements that we want to apply to the page so that people know where they are. Some of them are just, you know, maybe in the table of contents, you want it to appear differently than you want it to appear when you're actually viewing the page. So all of this content at the start, this is where we really want to begin. We want all of the writer to understand, uh, you know, this is, this is one article. And then underneath, uh, there's additional information. So when we go to the next slide, um, we're actually going to just kind of compress that so that we can get to the real meat of the content that the writer's providing. At this point, um, really, we're, we're, again, creating sets of, of sections that are repeatable. So you can have multiple different sections. You can choose when you want to create new sections. You can move them around, dragging and dropping. And within each section, there's uh, specific types of information you want about you know, the alignment, the, the headings, the actual content and supporting text, which, you know, is really, uh, in a lot of cases, the bulk. All of this information is being uh, stored when you save the page in individual fields that are all tied together based on, on the, the forms that we enter. So um, this is really the authoring view. And for us, this is understanding how we could break our content up. And this uh, effort to really define the structure, um, that's what we were missing. And that's what we're working towards um, now we're really trying to make sure that when we have these sections that we're able to uh, create structures that are reusable, that are, are efficient, and that, that make sense for our content. So um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so we showed you first what it looks like for an end user. Then I showed you what it looks like for uh, someone who's actually writing the content and editing it. This is what it looks like behind the scenes. So we said with Cargo, when we store content, it just all gets thrown into a database. And, and this is basically um, how the content is stored. You're seeing it. All of this is going to be queryable later. So that top section where we define the article and EPO information, um, all of that is right here. And it's available to be queried. You can use that to bring back sets of pages, to arrange pages in a different way. So you, can, you can do whatever you want, just like any database query with the information here. And then underneath, here's an example of one of the sections. It's got the type, it's got the alignment, it's got all of the same information that we saw earlier, but that's, this is how it's stored. And this is what makes it so powerful for us, is that um, even though it's a really easy to use editing, <coughs> editing interface, even though we try to make it so that anyone can work with our content, um, this is what's gonna allow the architects to really pull together content in, in interesting ways afterwards and reuse it. So um, we'll skip ahead one more slide. Now, I mentioned earlier there was a table of contents on the side. And that, you know, so we've talked a little bit about how content is stored and how it's edited. This is really kind of a, a tool for us that, screw, that stitches a lot of things together. Uh, you know, it was our screwdriver in the image because it, it helps me piece together different things. And what Minty Docs provides for us uh, as part of you know, our tool chain is it gives a lot of, uh, a lot of value to, uh, to how we make our content accessible, who we make it accessible to, uh, it gives us content management tools that allow us to quickly publish content, to copy uh, from one version to another, to uh, work with content in different ways. It allows us to define multiple versions we can work with. And uh, you know, it also works here with the table of contents that are dynamically built uh, in some cases, or in some cases that you can, be, you can define them yourself and you can adjust how, how content is uh, being entered and viewed. So um, this is you know, another piece of our tool. And uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, Docs' code has a lot of uh, really great forward progress, and uh, we really like Docs' code, but we've, we found that, you know, the output is not, uh, depending on your tool chain, the output that we were getting wasn't a, as flexible and as reusable as we want. So we built a pipeline, you know, our, like many people, our, our tools are stored in Get and GitLab, and you can see you know, our tool chain and what we expect, how, how we have our content work. Um, the key thing that I want to point out here is that you know, it's very easy for us to bring this content into MediaWiki. 
So you know, previously, it might have uh, it might have gone to a different uh, output. It might have gone to a different format type. But all of the tools that we have uh, in in MediaWiki and in Cargo as well both have APIs that we can use to bring content directly in. So once we have you know a docs as code uh, process established, getting our content uh, from here into structured content that's queryable is not a difficult process. Um, you can see uh, an, an example based on that code line, uh, based on that tool chain that we have. This would be uh, another table of contents where we have different types of articles. And this is, you know, the, the API that we're working with. We have some content that is generated uh, via, you know, the markdown file from our, our docs code. Uh, we have all of the, the swagger output that, you know, brings content back in. But for us, the other key thing is that using this tool chain, it makes it very easy for us to add articles wherever we need to. Uh, to improve our content, to add custom value that uh, wouldn't be gotten easily with the, uh, just with a simple uh, docs as code approach. So I think that's probably some of the key points for us about what we really wanted. Yeah, if we go to the next slide, uh, I think that, go to the I'll next just slide. say just something about the docs as code. So our, our company split across a few product lines. So some of our underlying APIs get manifested in different, uh, actually different documentation sets. So one of the issues, one of the things we want to be able to support is, you know, the stuff that belongs in the source code can live in the source code, and you can publish it up to that, you know, one particular implementation of using that API. But there may be differences in how a given platform uses the API. So the supporting material, the tutorials and all that, it would be difficult to get that in the common source, which needs to live in like three completely separate uh, platforms. So you can add, a layer of information directly in MediaWiki or MintyDocs, whatever, on top of it. But it's in the same table of contents. So from the user, for the, for the information experience, they just, go to their, they just go to their book and they have a mix of content coming from different sources. Some is written online by the author, the writers that are dedicated to that particular platform, but the underlying contents may be coming from the source code, right? So that yeah. flexibility is... Uh, it's useful. Yeah, and that's a key point about the view, like the view for the user, because like it's really about trying to provide them with the best view into our content. Yeah, so everything in one spot. Yeah. So you know, for us, we looked at that whole set of tool chains, and we said this is this is really what did provide a lot of value for us. We took Docs's code that that we were working with, and we really turned it into content as data, and then that allowed us to to just provide a lot more uh, flexibility in how that's presented. So. Um, and I think that's probably the last slide for this portion. Oh no, ha <laughs> sorry, uh, my apologies. It, it changes it to content as data, but I think the key point was uh, once, it's, once the content that we've pulled in is available to us as data, there are many different ways we can slice and dice. There's many different ways we can display that. In some cases, we had uh, you know, pop-ups that you can you know, quickly get, uh, we can do a quick call, we can see where they need content from the API and we can pull that out so there's uh, you know, little snippets of information available, available to them. We were able to convert very quickly entire sections of code into standalone FAQs that could be provided to customers for different reasons because uh, it's easy for us once the content is uh, in, in a data format, it's easy to restructure it. And it also allowed us a lot of uh, flexibility about uh, creating different portal pages, automating how our content was generated. Because uh, again, you know, you can decide how you want to break it up, where you want to break it up. Uh, you can report on it in different ways this way. So uh, all of, you know, once, it, once we have the structure defined, once we have the content into that structure and it's available to us to query as data, that just gave us all of the flexibility that we really wanted. So let's we'll see if this is the last slide. Oh, it is. All right. All right, so the other case study is the Genesis use cases. It's really difficult to talk about the use cases use case without sort of circular language. But so Genesis use cases are uh, um, I guess they're solutions really. So they're things that, that there's about a hundred of them or so and they're pretty beefy pieces of content that uh, the field, so the sales organization uses to try to tell, so Genesis software, by the way, it's, like, it's very customizable, very flexible, fairly complicated, so to try to streamline everything, again, because Genesis itself is kind of a bag of flour in, in some respects, right? So 
uh, try to streamline that, then try to be able to, like, this is what, this is what the software can do. There's about a hundred or so things I boiled down. This is what the software can do. So it was the team that was put together to uh, build all that content. And we don't author that content. As a writing group, we don't author that content. What we have set ourselves up as is a service organization to help that team manage their content. And I think one of the, the key uh, reasons the project's successful is uh, they had a really clear understanding of their data structure. So they, they already had a data structure. And they were trying to manage their data structure in tools that don't support structured data. We had unstructured data in tools that do support structured data. It was great to actually cut our teeth on a project that they already had, the, they already had the, the, the data structure so we could just, oh, awesome, we can make it work now. We know exactly how. Right? The hard work was already done. In my opinion, that's the hard work, is defining the data structure. And the rest is work, but it's more fun, I guess, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a description of some of that there. Um, this is sort of a layout of this, this project. So we built a, uh, uh, a portal that everyone goes to. Um, all, I guess it's mostly product managers and Professional services are mostly the authors. Sometimes the uh, offer management team, that's who handles the use case information, they'll, they'll have, uh, you know, they'll convene key stakeholders in, a, in an office somewhere for a week and they bang out the use cases. There's a lot of business decisions that go into the content there, right? So they're, they're, the, they're the subject matter experts and they do the authoring and we build uh, pipelines for them to, to uh, do that authoring. Um, yeah. Uh, it's something I want to show uh, a demo of. So, yeah. It's okay. I got it right here. Yeah. So the uh, an individual use case uh, has about fifty different fields, say, right? And uh, I'm going to try to show how, how the life cycle of one of these fields. So I'm going to talk about the benefits. So the benefits were unstructured, loosely structured data in their old system, which they tried to uh, um, impose some order on using process. But once the offer management team understood the, uh, you know, the power of the software, they realized we could, you know, the business can, if we get the right people together, they can decide what are the benefits. The benefits are, you know, um, for any, every use case has, you know, four or five benefits, say. So those are like business outcomes that, you know, a, a use case is going to help you improve your customer experience. What they realize is that working with, working with marketing, if they, if they set, if they decided what the benefit, like a canonical set of what the benefits are, they can define that and then that can cascade through the whole system. So this is where an administrator, at the administrative level, uh, they decide what the benefits are that can then be applied to a use case and then cascade through the system. So our role was to set up the, this is a, a, a page that only administrators can get to that they use to define the top level metadata, right? So we don't define this data, we provide the tools to let the team that owns this data define that data, and that's uh, sales and marketing and whoever else. So, um, so this is where you would go to, so they set a, uh, they set a code for a benefit which, is, which can't be changed, and then they set a title for the benefit which can be changed, and this is now available to the system. So when an author goes to uh, their form view for you know, filling the information for the use case, they select their benefit from a pre-existing list. Uh, if an administrator decides they want to change the, the wording for uh, improved conversion rates or something else, they do it here. It'll cascade through the whole system, through the authoring view, through all the displays, and through all the external sites that are pulling this data. Right? So this is an administrator view. That's a user role. And then this would be the uh, author view. So somebody is they're working on a particular use case, CEO one. They can only select the uh, business approved list of use case, but then they can add 
you know, a little bit of custom information that goes along with it. Both of those are stored in uh, cargo fields that can then be queried for anybody else who needs that information. Um, this is a view that the authors see to actually, this is, you know, how they actually change their, uh, so you can see it printed here. Again, this will, uh, you know, if you change the wording for improved customer experience at, the, at that uh, first administrator form, uh, it, it'll change here as well. And once that content is stored in Cargo that way, you can query it and you can do things like build this kind of a portal page that allows a customer to find a use case that they need based on a benefit, right? So if they want to look for improved customer experience, they can do a query. Behind the scenes, um, all the content that you see is query generated. Some of it is, uh, like it shows statically on a page, so it looks like just regular content you read, but actually behind the scenes, there's a query that's pulling whatever fields it wants, just we, whatever fields we want to display on the page. Uh, we choose those. This is a portal page that just lets you interact with that query. So you pass a parameter to the query and then it will spit out the content. So in this case, it lets you uh, uh, drill down into the use cases by selecting a benefit. I think when, as this project matures, there isn't going to be a way to go to a master list of all use cases and then customers will select a particular use case. It's not how the business wants to present use cases. They want to control how people find that information. So you have, to, you have to kind of go through a few steps first. What do you want to do? And you have to answer a few questions. You have to go through a few layers before to sort of narrow it down, because they don't really want people necessarily choosing a la carte. We want to guide that experience, which we can do. So we don't have to have a Minty Docs book with all use cases. We could, we could hide that. But in any case, this is, uh, this is the same view. And again, this text here is, that's the, you know, approve business language, and this is the specific language to support that benefit that authors have, uh, have added. So that's one field. Like I said, the use cases have about 50 fields. And once the content is built in this way, requests come up. So just a few weeks ago, there was a, a request come up. Uh, you know, ma the maturity level of a use case, this means I guess how business ready that use case is for, for selling. I'm be wrong on that, but I think that's what it is. Um, they wanted to set up a bunch of uh, books. So we set up some Minty Docs books that um, give you uh, a view into the available mature, the maturity level for all of the use cases. So there's, we built four books. This is for one of our, our platforms, Pure Engage. And, um, you know, it's really just tables that give you the results from one field that exists in the use case. But this field is important enough that the business wants to have, like, a full doc that has these tables that are static. They can create a PDF of it. They can use that to disseminate the field and so on. And just to understand, like, once the content, it takes about, it took a, less than an afternoon to build these four or five books, right? So once the content's in there, and you have, to, you have to build a new view into your 50 fields or so, it's pretty straightforward, right? You just build a new doc, set up your queries, and you just select which ones you want. If somebody wanted to add a new field to this page, we just change the underlying qu query, add a new field, put it in a div or whatever, a table, and then we, uh, we can alter the, uh, the view. That's sort of covering a little bit what we've already talked about there. Alternate displays. So this is an example of one, oh, what happened? So this is an example of uh, uh, integration with uh, our sales marketing group is building a new uh, web portal for all their sales collateral. So this is where Salespeople to go to uh, 
basically download their beautiful brochures and PDFs and whatnot that they use to go into the field and, uh, and, and make sales. And there's a large part of that content is, is uh, um, supports the Genesis use cases, right? And uh, the, what the, you know, how they've been managing this is uh, somebody's job was to go to the old single source of truth for use cases, copy the information, paste in the PDF, upload it into their tool. Um, I can't remember what the tool was, but they would basically, basically was, they just uploaded documents to a tool. And it was always out of date, and it was really uh, business people whose job is to generate revenue were spending a lot of their, a lot of their days I think this is not unique to Genesis or <laughs> information technology in general. A lot of people spend their time managing documents, massaging documents, copying content from one silo to another. Um, so this is a tool called Seismic that has a, they have a concept called Live Doc, which is basically a PowerPoint generation tool that they can hook into different data sources and pull in uh, content at runtime to build a PDF that, so a salesperson wants a PDF for a particular use case, they have to go to their, their portal, click a button, and then the PDF is generated, but it pulls from our cargo data store um, on the fly, right? So this is sort of an example, I mean, I don't have access to their tool, so I had to take screenshots during the demo and as much as I could show, because <laughs> that's another problem, right? Is every, every team owns their own tools and getting licensing and access across an organization is, is difficult. But um, some of these other tools have, you know, they all have, their, everyone has their own API. So you can, you know, that single source of truth model, it doesn't necessarily mean that our team has to own the single source of truth for all content. There's uh, sellable items, for example, which are stored in Salesforce, and that's where they need to stay. So we need to build an uh, API connector to Salesforce to pull that. There's different kinds of single source of truth and we want, you know, I guess it's the web application to web application communication of content is what we think is really interesting and uh, it just seems like that's where things are going. So the old, you know, a publishing tool chain that publishes to a variety of different outputs, that does not seem to be where, the where, where things are going when we're communicating with other groups. When you start talking about REST API and web services for content, they know exactly what you're talking about, right? When you start talking about, uh, can we take over your portal so we can publish and have a single source of truth? It's a non-starter, it doesn't go anywhere, right? All right. Um, all right. So the thing we really want to hit, I mean, there's, you know, we've been using MediaWiki for quite a few years, and we're still learning a lot of detail about how you can, how you can uh, leverage it. And there's, you know, there's business and political things we've learned, but I think the, the key thing is, uh, the key takeaway is define your data structure. The more you can define your data structure, the more, uh, the more you can do with your content. Um, I think that's it. Thanks. So do yeah. we do a question? So actually, does anybody have any questions? And if so, we'll give you the mic so that it can go in the recording. So questions? Um, yeah, you mentioned you built uh, this tool that's used by salespeople. And you said they used to spend a lot of time doing this manually. So um, did they love that tool or did you have to sell them on it? What's been their response? So the offer management team that owns the use case project uh, is the one driving that integration. So we're the service organization for them, but they bring us into calls. And so we're sort of like the technical backup, but they do most of the, uh, the pushing and the selling of that, right? Um, yeah, they're pretty happy about it because they spend their time massaging documents, right? And anybody who gets that, they can, oh, we, it'll all just automatically populate the whole thing. Uh, 
they like that, right? It's going to make their life easier. Yeah. Up front, there's work, but it's, it's a big payoff. Well, the automation always has that theoretical payoff, but apparently it's working. Yeah. And I, I just want to expand on that by saying that, you know, um, I think it's a really big deal for us. When we have content, uh, there are a lot of users who are helping us to create content, uh, and there's a lot of different roles. Like we, we kind of outlined in some slides and we glossed over it a little bit, but there are a lot of different roles about how, how that content is created. And so, you know, while you might have some people that are really defining the structures and other people that are, you know, filling in the, the high level idea of how you want your content to be built, and then there's other writers who are adding content, um, you know, like there's a lot of different people all the way down the chain, and for us it was really valuable. Uh, we found with Enterprise Media Wiki, we could accommodate people at, at a lot of different levels. And so, you know, some of the sales people, uh, you know, they, they needed assistance with defining data structures. Uh, sorry, not with defining, because they already had a good definition. They, had a, they needed some assistance in like kind of implementing those data structures into the, the, the content. But once that was set up, then it was really them off and running, because, you know, all of those lower level of, of the content creation was that. Yeah, it's, it's been a big time saver, and I haven't heard anything but praise basically from them. So. If you um, years ago had, had switched to DITA, would this have all been possible through DITA, or is there some reason why uh, you're doing this in, a, in this particular way? I don't, I don't know. Uh, every once in a while I look, so we've never, I've, I've never really used, I used it a little bit, like 10 plus years ago, so I'm sure it's matured a lot since then. But uh, I've been looking to see if there was query-based tools. I, they may be out there, but I haven't run across it. So it's more like you build maps, but I don't know if it's that same kind of query-based tools, and I don't know if you can have that full flexibility of, you know, your you know, your tiny little piece of data could be a content structure, but a whole page could also be a content structure or a paragraph. Like, you, just, you set it up the way you want. So I don't know. And another aspect of it is uh, there's some content in the system that it's fine. Just let it be free text. We don't need to structure it. So uh, you can build heavily structured content automation projects within your content and only for that content. So it's like uh, you avoid CMS overkill or uh, something where, you know, if you have to put all your content into, you know, into something like DITA because you, you think you may have some reuse possibilities, but it turns out that it's only 5% of your content that actually needs that reuse, you kind of, over, it's just too much, you know? So you can leave things be unstructured for some areas, and then you can structure some areas. So it's just you're very flexible, right? Yeah. I just want to, um, you hit almost all the points I want to mention, but I, I do want to say that as well, I feel like with Enterprise Media Wiki, we, we get uh, a really good combination of tools that, that work together very well. And, you know, it's kind of like one package does, does almost everything we need where uh, and forgive me, my, like I haven't used DITA for a while, but my understanding is that if you're working in DITA, that's really one piece of your solution because you haven't dealt with presentation. You haven't dealt with a lot of other really significant portions of how you're going to work with documentation. And, and for us, this came together really nicely as a, a parcel that, you know, supported us in ways that, that, uh, that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do things. I wouldn't fault anyone for, for using DITA, but um, if you asked me, you know, a few years ago, if we knew about this, if we knew about DITA, you know, how can we didn't how can we chose one over the other? I think that the convenience of the, the whole package makes this really appealing for us. So, is that fair? Yeah, I, yeah. And uh, headless CMS tools like Contentful, there's a bunch now that are getting a lot of play. That's that seems more appealing to me because it's about it's about APIs and it's about uh, web application to web application communication and sharing of content between web applications. So that's where I would think is more, that seems more interesting to me, is the head of the CMS approach. So if we were going to switch tools, it would probably be more towards that. that. But that's also a bag of flour, right? I mean, the headless CMS, they're really, they're a developer tool, right? So if you're a developer and you want to build a website and you just, you don't want to have to build it on top of a CMS, you build your website and you pull in the content by reference from 
content flow or whatever else, which is similar. So with this system, you kind of have your CMS, but it also can act as a headless CMS for other sites to pull from. So it's kind of mixing the two is, is what was what's happening, yeah. That scares me because it's a big flower that you don't even own, so you're kind of, I, I get a little nervous sometimes with the, the web-based ones, but right. that's, yeah. it, it would be very good. Other questions? Do you translate? What's that? Do you translate content? Yes. Well, no, I don't. <laughs> but we, we, uh, we have vendors that translate our content, yeah. And does this make their lives better? Does it make your costs lower? They don't like it very much. They don't like wiki markup. Essentially, a lot of wiki markup is the way we, and we didn't set up the way we were supposed to. So, I mean, Wikipedia is like the largest, the most translated content uh, on the planet, right? I mean, it's gone. It, so, but we're not really using the tools. And I don't know where we set up the way that we should. So, the, the, the vendors are doing some, you know, they have some custom scripts to deal with the mix of wiki markup and, uh, and uh, HTML and inline CSS and stuff like that, but they work around it. We've been using we've been using them for you know a number of years, so we do translate. Yeah. Okay. And the second question: If you were to do this again, mm -hmm. what would you do? Just top one or two. What would you do differently? I would define my data structure. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely, you would spend like a month with key stakeholders figuring out what you want from your content before the horse leaves the barn. Because once it's gone, it's hard to impose that structure afterwards, yeah. So we're at a position right now for various reasons, the way the company's moving, that we can, we kind of have to start fresh and we want to take advantage and define our data structure. Which I think is, doesn't matter what tool chain you're using, that's still the key problem. Like, what do you want to do with your content? You know, like if you're using Ditto or whatever, a lot of folks don't have a data model they put on top of it. It's, you know, that, that's just the plumbing. What do you want your content to do? And then maybe don't, they maybe just take the default output from a bunch of tools and, and think that's doing something for people and it really isn't, right? Yeah. Right. So how long did it take for you to build this infrastructure and how many people do you have working on the tooling side of things? Well, I mean, we've got it extended in so many directions. So we got a lot of people working on on MediaWiki, but a lot of them are like Ed, who are, is an API writer, who uh, you know does it sort of part time. We have a couple like full time people. We have some other parts of our we didn't talk about here. We have a contextual help system that has heavy development costs. We have search applications that are customized. So. Yeah, so the use case uh, content structure, probably six months, 50% one person to build the data structure for that project. Yeah. There, there was a lot of, uh, it's, it's important to know the use cases, they had already defined the data structure before. Thank you. So, you know, they had a good portion of the work done, but the actual implementation I don't think is that costly. I think it's more the preparation and, uh, understanding, you know, the buy-in that you're going to need from from the company when you move in the direction, which is always challenging. I'm interested in two things. First of all, can you just talk about the impact that this approach had on your writing team, the people that are actually writing the content, and how they felt about it when it happened versus how that changed over time? And then two, have you looked at how the impact any kind of study on the impact this had on your user experience? How, how is it helping your readers or your, your key audiences? So studies? <laughs> no, we don't, we, don't, we don't have like statistics to show, you know, is the user experience better? We have various feedback mechanisms built into the content. Uh, I think that tends to be focused on the actual content, right? So we have, uh, uh, I don't know, that's a hard question to answer. Yeah, you kind of have to make some assumptions, right? Yeah. Can 
Sure. Yeah, so speaking to the use case project in particular, uh, it's, it's pretty successful because they had, it was just a free for all for their content. So having, having uh, their authors be guided in a friendly manner is very useful. Then for users, it's hard to tell. The appetite for reading the content, the use case content, is really high because it's, it's, it's a key description of how, um, how Genesis operates. From a content point of view, the use case content is, is like solution level documentation that uh, spans across product silos. So it's the kind of documentation that we've had a really hard time writing because our writers are embedded on product teams, so we have a very narrow product focus. And getting that subject matter expertise, which is not from your development team, but it's from uh, a higher level, from professional service and product management. Since they're the authors, it's a huge improvement in our content because it gives us that layer. Now what we're doing is we're building uh, automatic tagging of articles to connect to that use case content so that one of the every page is page one principle. So you hit a page, there's gonna be a little marker to let you know what use cases does this article support, which will take you, link to that, bump you up to that top level solution level, you know, description of what the software actually does, which helps ground people in that layer of information that otherwise gets a little bit lost. You know, either it doesn't exist, or it's just a link in a search result or so that, like using that tagging, right? And using, using the uh, metadata, mo the data structure to drive users to those high value pages, right? That's what we're, we're setting up. So now that we have those pages, we want like every single piece of content should, should really clearly list what, what use cases it belongs to and then bump them up. Because those use cases have really nice business flow diagrams explaining how it works from a, a business flow in our regular tech order content, we have a lot of flow diagrams that describe, you know, how a software method pings through the system. It's always from the, it's more, it's very technical, it? you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just going to mention that for us as well, like, uh, you questioned the impact on the writers and for us, this has been a process. We, we didn't arrive here. We, we got here sometimes stumbling a little bit, sometimes making really good choices and not understanding how good they were when we made them. And like it's, a, it's a mix of, of different methods. Um, and so if we were to do things over again, I think we would do things differently in, in some cases that would try to impact the writers less. Um, for us specifically, like the transition from uh, MediaWiki alone and then pushing into structured content with several new tools, I mean, that that did introduce, uh, and you know, we are in the process of doing that. We, we only have a few writers that are still you know, actively doing that for our content, for, uh, who are you know, kind of beta testing this as we're moving forward. And so um, there is, uh, there definitely is an impact. I think most of what I've seen is positive, but I mean, we are, uh, like any process, we're still working through that. What I will say is um, part of what convinced us to move in this direction is that we had a number of smaller projects initially that treated data as uh, treated content as data for different reasons, and so we had you know huge uh, configuration options guides that were just you know, massive tomes that were very difficult to dig through that are all automated because we're treating uh, that data as, as we're treating that content as data and we're making it very easy to access and we've had very positive feedback and results from that uh, and we've had a couple of other like smaller scale uh, examples of moving in this direction and they've always been very positively received so. I don't know if that's something that's that's like what you're looking for, but it's. Um, I I think it's a very positive direction. I think that uh, you know, learn from our mistakes and, and do better than us, and define your data first, and then move forward from there. That's that's what I'm going to say. So I think we have time for one more question from the floor, and then uh, Jessica Parsons is going to give a couple of announcements from Write the Docs, and then we're going we have we have the room for another half hour, so. Please, after these couple of things, feel free to mingle and ask your questions in more depth. Michael, you had a question? No, or somebody else have a question? question? Did somebody else have a question out here? Okay. You showed that screenshot of the Alto Cloud uh, page. How did that writer 
uh, receive this new system, per Paul's question? It was one of your first. Did we? Ha I don't know if we had AltaCloud in there. She was our very patient alpha tester, right? This page. <laughs> yeah. So that's one thing, though, I think I get a, uh, a challenge, right, where it's so flexible. So you get feedback on things that don't work. You just change it. Super great. Flexible. If somebody doesn't like how the form works, you just change it. But it also means that it's always changing. And for some people, they're like, what do I do? How do I do my job? And they want it to just be exactly how it always was. And where we're changing it all the time. So for some folks, they love that because they like to be on the edge. And some people, we got a lot of writers. We got like 60, 60 plus writers. So some people, it's, uh, it's too much change. Their head's spinning. Yeah. That, that sounds really scary. It doesn't, you know, it, the change is decreasing. The rate of change is decreasing, I think, though, as we stabilize. But the ability to change has not decreased. And our ability to adapt has not been effective so uh, yeah. but uh, yeah Dan has been a real champ to, to uh, yeah. work through the struggles that we had initially when we we're moving in this direction so yeah I, I think she likes it she loves it yeah <laughs> I'm saying for the video <laughs> hope I don't get in trouble all right well thank you everybody all right so yeah thank you thanks guys